John chapter 6, please. John chapter 6 in your Bible. Um, Brother Bill, I think, um, Brother Bill just walked in back there, so if you give him one of these two. Uh, again, we're going, to, we're going to get into our Revelation subject. I'm, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but I just wanted you to see these. I wanted you to get them in your hands. These Bible study forms, let, let me just explain something. When I was um, probably about um, Joni's age, um, I was diagnosed with ADHD. They didn't call it that in that day, but that's what it is. Um, I have terrible trouble concentrating. I, um, uh, my mind goes in a dozen different directions at once. I, I, uh, I can't focus my thinking very easily. So one of the things that's always helped me is to have a form to work off of, um, something to focus my thoughts this is a discipline I have created for myself to help myself um, organize my thoughts. And I was thinking the other day as I was working on my thoughts and, and on this, um, I've used a variety of forms over the years, uh, but none of them had exactly what I wanted. And, and I got to thinking to myself, you slug, uh, you know how to use Excel as well as anybody else. Why don't you do it? So... I sat down for a few hours, and um, I thought to myself, if I wanted to create the ultimate Bible study form, something that would be, um, you can take this at the beginning of the week and use it all week long to do your Bible study. Um, now, for me, I use one of these a day. Um, but for you, uh, who, who probably don't have the luxury of time that I do since I'm not working, and don't have anything gainfully to do. Um, this, this really is a wonderful way um, for you to take these thoughts, these um, truths, and to translate them into something that will be helpful for you. Now, the wonderful thing about this is it's free. It doesn't cost you anything except for your time to go on to... Um, uh, makingvictory.org uh, on our website and go to Bioma Notes on the uh, and there's a Bible study form PDF you can download it and you can print this as many times as you want to um, and I say in my last slide on here and I'll mention it now unless I forget um, if you have suggestions or want to change this that's fine you're welcome to do whatever you want to I would really appreciate the suggestions. If there's something I have not included on here, I would like it to be included. So if you look over this and say, you know, Brother Kevin, you need a widget on there. Uh, I don't know what a widget is, but it, it, you just say, you need to put this on there. Then you tell me, I'll put it on and because I want it to be helpful. But I just want to run through these and go through this really quick. Um, and I've given you a packet of these so that you can look at the form. So let's look at the first one up there. And again, this can be found on our website under Bioma Notes, or you can email me at BibleTeacher57 at Outlook, and I will be happy to send you one by return, just, just that quick. Uh, the form is designed, uh, this first form is sort of the who, what, where, when, and why questions for any passage that you read. You can put the date, the Bible book, the passage you're looking at. Who is the author of the book that you're doing? Uh, what is the key theme? Now you say, wait a minute, where am I going to find this? Well, if you have a good study Bible, and I recommend the Ryrie Study Bible or the Old Schofield Reference Bible, either one of those will be just loaded with information like that that will help you. So if, if you go there, now if you don't have that and you can't find that, I also have on, on the Bioma website, I have a book, uh, it's about a 200 page book that I did and it's up there and it's free for you that goes through every book of the Bible, gives you the key theme, the author, the date, 
all of this material is up there. It's, it's Bible survey, and you can just go up there and get it and download it, and you can plug all this information in. Um, there, for example, uh, let me just mention, uh, for example, if you're looking at major themes or ideas, if we're looking at the book of Romans, that would be God's righteousness. Um, there's a large section in there about um, a dispensational speaking of what is God going to do with Israel. God's not finished with Israel. And then there's a large practical section of how should I live the doctrine that I've been taught. Those three things should go in that section. Um, there, Schofield and Ryrie, particularly Ryrie, give you great outlines. You could put the outline right there in your, in your notes. Um, and what you can do if you have a filing cabinet, um, or if you like to scan things into your computer, put it in your filing cabinet, or scan it in your computer, and you'll have this for time to come. Um, key verses. Oftentimes, your study Bible will have the key verses in there, too. And then ideas to explore. I put that in there for you, for you to decide what is interesting to me. What do I want to, do I have any particular questions? When I go into this book, what do I want to know? And those things will help you a great deal. Write them all down. And, um, or as you're going through the book, and, and let me suggest this to you. As you're reading through the Bible and you get a question, write it down on this, on this section about things to consider. Um, or ideas to explore, write it down and then bring it to Pastor Kenny. Give him a heart attack. Somebody comes asking him a Bible question, he will fall over. Um, or come and bring it to me uh, and say, this is a question I had when I was reading this past. I talked to Bill Wolf yesterday. We had a wonderful conversation about the biblical topic of widows. Um, have you ever had questions about the three types of widows in the Bible? Write it down. Put it there and say, you know, I, it may be not even thing to do with what you're talking about, but it's just a question that occurred to you. You put it down here. You get your questions answered because you can then take this and talk to somebody or look it up and, and get some help. And then down at the bottom you see resources consulted. I, I, look, I've come to this... Where did I get all this material I put on these other things? Somebody asked me, where did you get all this? Well, I could put it in the resources. I got this off of Brother Kevin's book. On the, or I got this off my Ryrie Study Bible. I got this off my Schofield Study Bible. You just write down where you got it from so that you can go back and find it again. Um, I found that to be very helpful. So any questions on um, the first page? All right, let's turn to page two. This is the beautiful thing. I love this. Um, I use this probably more than anything else. Um, this is your Bible word treasure house, uh, your word treasure house. Um, what this is, pardon that old bad back guy trying to pick something up. Um, look at John chapter 6. Uh, verse 63. John set chapter 6, verse 63. The Bible says it is the spirit that quickeneth. Now, quickening means to make alive. Um, have you ever uh, cut a fingernail to the quick? Um, I, I, because I have thyroid conditions, sometimes my fingernails just break. And one of mine broke the other day on, uh, on this finger right here. It just broke, and I, it was hanging there, and I thought, oh, it's just, a little, um, it's just a little broken fingernail, so I just reached over to jerk it off and ripped half the quick off my finger. And I'm telling you, uh, I don't have much feeling, but what feeling I had made me want to stand on my head. Um, so I know about the quick. That's the living part. My fingernails are dead, but my... Uh, 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 my uh, uh, flesh underneath it is alive. And so when he says um, the spirit quick, that quickeneth, that means that makes alive. The flesh profiteth nothing. 
the words. Uh, notice that word words there. Now, if I were doing a study on this, I would write down the word spirit, quickeneth, profiteth, words, speak, spirit, life. I would put those all down. Um, and then I would uh, look at the, put the verse down, um, the English word down, and then I would go look at what the original word was. Um, you say, where am I going to get that, Brother Kevin? Well, I've given you a Bible, um, a couple of Bible sites that you can get those. Um, it's linked to the King James Version. You can click on that. It will take you right to a lexicon, um, Thayer's, uh, Art and Gingrich, um, and allow you to be able to just pull that right up, and you'll be able to see what that word is. So um, now I have uh, these uh, notes for you. I, I ran off the house and left it, but um, if you want this, um, before then, just email me and I'll send it to you so you can have these links. It's really important. Uh, but these will let you fill this in so you can put in uh, the verse, the English word, and then there's a transliteration of the, of the original word. And then you can look at the Strong's Dictionary, which is also online, and it will give you the meaning. And you can write that down there, and then that gives you the opportunity. You know, Brother Kenny will get up here, Pastor Kenny will get up here and say, well, this word originally meant, well, now you know where he gets it. And it will help you um, to, to do that. So um, these, these websites will be a big help. Now, if you're not web active, then um, there are a couple of resources you could buy. Come see me and I will help you with that. But um, uh, those are the things that uh, this word study house, uh, treasure house, though, will let you go back and look at different words in the passage and say, that's what that means, and allows you to help understand the scripture. All right, so um, that's, that's that. Any question about that? I see a lot of deer in the headlights look, but um, all right. So the next one here, I think, is also very helpful, and that's your verse note storehouse. Um, you write down either the reference to the verse in the, uh, in the far left-hand side, either the reference to the verse or actually write the verse itself. Now, I find it more helpful for me to write the whole verse out in that little space. Um, and Because most Bible verses aren't that long. And really, it's a good thing as you write that out, it helps you look at that word and, and kind of get the understanding of it. And then... Um, by the way, that, that just reminds me, I was going to tell you in John chapter 6, verse uh, 63, the Bible says, the words I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. There are two Greek words in the Bible for word. One is the logos. Everybody knows logos. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. That's the thought, the idea. Um, you know, when you say dog... What comes into your mind is a hairy thing with four legs and a tail. And, you know, you've sort of got that in your mind. That's the idea of that word. It's the thought concept behind that. That's, that's what you speak, and, and people get the thoughts that you have. That's that word, but that's not what Jesus is saying here. There's a second Greek word, and that's the word rhema. Rhema. You've got to have your rhema. Um, and that word means um, the very written word, uh, A, B, C. Um, so if I'm talking dog, I'm talking about D, O, G, written on a page. Not the, um, not the thought or concept of the dog, but the actual written word. So what is Jesus saying there? He's saying that the very words of Scripture are alive and are life-giving. And he's not talking about the thoughts. That's why I reject the NIV out of hand. What NIV is, dynamic equivalency, they're trying to do a thought-for-thought -thought translation. I want the King James that gives me the word-for-word -word translation from the Bible. 
I want to know what the exact word is. I want to get there as close as possible. Sometimes King James is hard to read because it is so accurate. But I suggest to you that I would rather, um, it's like the old story that was told about um, the, uh, the girl who went to um, a piano recital for her uh, best friend. And she sat next to a great pianist during that and afterwards her friend sought her out and said, what in the world did my per that great um, performer say of my playing? And she said, oh, he said it was heavenly. She said, was that exactly what he said? She said, well, no, that's not exactly what he said, but it's what he meant. And she said, well, what exactly did he say? And she, he, she said, well, what is that unearthly noise? <laughs> you see, you can misinterpret things. And what we want to do is interpret correctly. And so the very words, and that's why I say it's important to do word study in the Bible. All right? Um, so moving on, the verse note storehouse up here, uh, on one side you can write the verse and then you can go through and there's just blank notebook paper on the other side where you can just write what the meaning of all those words are or what this verse teaches um, and make your own little commentary um, on, on the Bible. Or write down what Dr. McGee says or what uh, Pastor Kenny says, or or what I say, or you know somebody who who um, you you have confidence in, um, and it's a good place to put questions down, um, and then you can go back to this in the future and say, um, oh, I've got I I, wrote, I did a Bible study on that. I know what that is. Any questions about this? This is also very practical. All right, um, let's move to the next one here. And that's the workspace. And basically, I just gave you, um, this is because I like, I'm wordy, and I need more space. So I just put lots of extra space on there. Um, and that's just for you. You can even draw pictures. And you know, I find that helpful for me when, when pastor is speaking sometimes. I'm sitting there taking notes, but I'm also drawing pictures. Uh, because pictures help me focus and concentrate. Um, and so you can take notes uh, uh, on Wednesday night. You can take notes on, on Sunday. And you can take notes on Sunday school. And just take this with you and take notes on it. So this will be helpful for that. And then the next page is uh, really the payoff. This is the practical application page. There are two different divisions. On the top side, there are notes and quotes and illustrations. If pastor tells a story that you really like, you want to write it down, there's a place to do it. Um, if uh, you've read a passage of scripture and, and a thought occurs to you about something, um, you can write that down and use that as an illustration. And then below is life application and reflection. I always ask myself after going through all the words, looking at all the notes and all of that, so what does this mean to me? What's the application for me? Um, what do I learn out of this? And I put that down there in the blue section. All right? And then finally... The, the back is the, um, is the memory aid, aid page. And basically, that's a place to write down all of the, uh, all the resources or references that you used during this. If you want to follow up on something, you can write this down. Um, and then you can go back and use this again. So again, all of this is just designed to make your Bible study a little bit easier, a little bit more focused. Now, does anybody have any questions over this? Or suggestions about anything that you'd like to see on there? Will you read it? You think about it. And um, if uh, something occurs to you, um, certainly let me know. I, I'm always uh, willing and able to um, include different things and, and a little bit different information. All right. So... Having exhausted that, let's move really quickly to uh, our actual subject. Um, we are looking in the book of uh, Re Revelation chapter 2, 
And I'm just going to pick up where we left off last time, Revelation chapter 2. And we're looking at the church of Pergamos. And um, we've been looking at verse 14. I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam. Now, last week, I introduced Balaam to you. I said that his name appears over and over again in the Old Testament, but then in the New Testament, he's mentioned again and again and again. Three things the Bible mentions about him in the New Testament. Number one, the way of Balaam. That's in 2 Peter chapter 2 uh, and verse 15. Now, the way of Balaam was this. Um, Balaam was a for-profit prophet. Um, you ever heard the name Joel Olstein, prosperity gospel preacher? Um, these people are in it for the money. Um, now, I don't, I'm not trying to be denigrating or anything like that. I don't have any personal acts to grind. Um, he's certainly free to make money however he wants to. But I would just tell you, um, that's not the case for most of us uh, Bible-believing preachers. We, we just give God's word as it is so that people will um, know what God has to say. Uh, but there are some people that preach for pay. And they, they will present a wonderful message, make you feel really good, um, and the way of Balaam is to, to preach for pay. Uh, ba Balak got Balaam to come uh, to curse the nation of Israel. He was willing to sell God out for money. And so that's the way of Balaam. Then Jude refers to the error of Balaam in Jude chapter 11. Um, and let's look at that real quick. Jude is right before the book of Revelation. So Jude 11... Um, there are no chapters in Jude, it's just verses. So uh, listen to what um, Jude says. Woe unto them, for they have gone the way of Cain and have ran greedily, notice that, after the error of Balaam for reward and perished in the gainsaying of Kor. Now, um, the error of Balaam is this, that Balaam believed he could curse what God had blessed and bless what God had cursed. Now, I hate to say it, but um, there are people who are willing to stand up and run the Bible down. Say all kinds of wicked things about the Bible. That the Bible is not trustworthy. That you can't believe the Bible. Um, look, if I were to go to an optometrist and he were starting to work on me with all of his instruments and everything like that, and he were saying, as he was working on my eyes, he said, you know, I really don't have any confidence in this. I don't think this is going to give me a true reading of your vision. I would get up and leave. What if you went to a doctor, and the doctor, he's examining you, checking your blood pressure, looking in your eyes and ears and all of that, and he says, you know what? I don't believe in the germ theory. I don't believe in, um, in medicine, really. Well, why are you practicing medicine? Go out and do psychiatry or, or something like that. Do something else, but don't, don't say that you, you're practicing medicine. This is what um, Balaam did. Um, he was trying to, God had told him very specifically, you must bless Israel, you can't curse them. And he kept thinking, well, I'll go from this mountain to the next mountain because they believed, and this is a, a way that you can maybe understand some local, the gods of, uh, of the Old Testament were essentially local gods. Baal was in charge over here and Ashtaroth over here and all of that. And he thought by moving from one location to the other, that maybe he could go to a place, you, you know, have you ever been with your cell phone and there's no reception? He was kind of hoping to go to a place where God wasn't and that he could sneak a quick curse in on the nation of Israel. And he found out that you cannot bless that which God curses and you cannot curse 
That's Balaam's error. You cannot curse that which God has blessed. Um, look, same-sex marriage is under the curse of God. And I can't bless that. Now, I want to be kind. I want to be loving. I, I don't have an anti-gay agenda. I love gay people. I want to see gay people saved. And, and by the way, Christ can do that. Um, being gay is just as much a sexual sin as committing fornication or anything else. Uh, it, it's just wrong. It's, it's bad, and um, it, it can, according to the Apostle Paul, be cured. And I believe it. You're not born that way. You make a choice. And uh, that's what the Bible says. And, and uh, you know, we've, we've studied the genetics of it, and, and it's very clear that it's simply a choice that people make. So you can't curse that which God has blessed, and you can't bless that which is God has cursed. He thought he could impose his will over God's word. And he made four attempts to curse Israel, and each time he only blessed her more. Now, I'm just saying to you that there are people who will try and twist what God says to their own advantage. And you know what? There are people just like that sitting in this room. Let me tell you how this works. There's some of you are saying, I want to know what God's will is in my life. So I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the lottery. I'm, I, I'm going to sit here and uh, just close my Bible and I'm going to open it up and put my finger down. Wherever my finger goes, that's the will of God. Now you, you laugh about that, but that was a family custom of ours. Um, every New Year's, the first thing we did when we got out of bed was stick our finger in our Bible and um, we would come up with a verse. Now, what if you put your finger on Judas went out and hanged himself? And you say, well, that's not too good a verse, so I'll find another one. You stick your finger in the Bible again and it says, go and do thou likewise. You say, well, I don't want that. I stick my finger in somewhere else and you put your finger on it and it says, and what thou doest, do quickly. I, I tell you, at that point, I would be really wanting to give up that, that whole idea. Um, that's how some people, or they will come with an idea and they say, God, here's my idea. I want to do this. You bless it, okay? That's not how you approach God. You say, God, hear, speak, Lord, your servant heareth. All right? So the error of Balaam is to think that I can impose my will on God. All right. The third error, and that's the doctrine of Balaam, that's what we read here in the book of Revelation. And I want you to notice specifically what he says about it. So let's read this verse again. I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam. And the word hold means to cling to, to hang on to. The doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. All right, so um, what did he do? Well, um, in the book of Numbers, we are told that this Balaam character, um, he went out and, and this is what he did. Let me just read to you from uh, the book of Numbers, chapter 25. Um, let, let me give you Numbers 31 first. That will give you kind of the understanding of it. Behold, these caused the children of Israel, this is Numbers 31, 16, through the counsel of Balaam to commit trespass against the Lord in the matter of Peor, and there was a plague among the congregation of the Lord. So Balaam gave some advice at Peor. And what was that advice? Well, let's see what it is in Genesis, or I, I'm sorry, Numbers 25. Numbers 25, verses 1 through 6. And the Bible says, Israel um, abode a Shittim, and the people began to commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab. Now this means they started marrying unsaved girls. They started intermarrying. You know what um, Balaam's uh, counsel was? He said, get your girls, get your daughters down there, have them put their makeup on, put a lot of rouge on, 
get the hair all fixed up, wear one of those little tight skirts and their, long, their, he, their high heels and send them down there and those Israelite boys will fall for them. And when they fall for those girls, then you've got them. Because what will happen is God told the nation of Israel to be separate, to be pure. And they were not to marry outside. And um, you, you send your daughters down there and lure them. In, and you know what's going to happen? Of course, you marry, uh, so you marry Giselda. Um, she's the Moabite. You marry her. And she says, now I want you to meet my god, Molech. Um, and, you know, you want to please your wife. And so, well, okay, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. You go to her church, and before too awful long, you're sacrificing your children to Molech. Um, that's exactly what um, happened here. So um, they got the people to commit whoredom with the daughters of uh, Moab, and they called the people unto the sacrifices of their gods. See what I told you? And the people did eat eating things sacrificed unto idols, and bowed down to their gods. And Israel joined himself to Baal Peor. That's Baal of Peor. That is a specific idol. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And the Lord said unto Moses, uh, Take all the heads of the people and hang them up before the Lord against the sun, that the fierce wrath of the Lord may be turned away from Israel. And Moses said to the judges of Israel, Slay every one his man that are joined unto Baal Peor. And behold, one of the children of Israel came and brought, um, uh, uh, brought unto his brethren a Midianitish woman in the sight of Moses and in the sight of the congregation of the children of Israel who were weeping before the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. He said, Look, enter Mary. Um, compromise your, your faith and then pretty soon you'll be having the idol barbecue and before awful long you know first of all you're repulsed by idolatry and then you begin to tolerate it and then you begin to participate in it and then you begin to love it and that's what happened with the nation of Israel and that was all Balaam's advice. Balaam said, look, I can't curse the nation of Israel. I've tried uh, on four separate occasions, and I can't curse these people. But here's what I can do. I can render them inefficient, ineffective for God. And so there are two things that happen. Um, whenever you have incorrect uh, belief, you're going to have immoral behavior. Um, you look at the, the teaching of the Roman Catholic Church, um, celibacy for their priests and nuns. What's happened? This epidemic of molesting young boys, uh, young girls. Uh, bad doctrine leads to bad behavior. Um, and it happens. Uh, I happened to pastor in Mormon country in Indiana when I was there. And um, I, I led a lady to the Lord that had been a Mormon. Um, and uh, she said that there is more child abuse in the Mormon community than you could possibly imagine. Um, and I'm talking about sexual abuse among children in the Mormon community. Um, it, it's just... Uh, the, the whole idea of multiple wives and look they may not say that they believe it but it's still a core doctrine of their, their belief there are millions of souls up there in heaven waiting for bodies according to Mormon doctrine and they've got to have those bodies by having as many wives as possible so that they can conceive as many spirit children as possible now that's garbage it, it's wrong but nonetheless, that's their basic teaching. So, incorrect belief is going to lead to incorrect behavior. All right, so um, we're going to stop at that point. Are there, is there any questions about what we've talked about this morning? All right, um, let's bow before the Lord in prayer, asking him to dismiss us with his blessing. Heavenly Father, thank you.